David's probably going to tell you about yourself, but one thing that he told me we were before service that he's been in the Gideons for 51 years and probably makes him a founding member. I don't know. <laughs> no, but but uh, again, I have heard him before and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Joe. Now, one thing, 51 years ago, I had brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a friend who says that gray hair causes brain damage. And I'm beginning to believe him because of, sometimes I don't even know where I live or uh, get up to go to the kitchen and can't remember what I went for. So, but uh, I don't know nobody else in here ever has that problem. Uh, while I'm talking, if you'd like to open your Bibles to Isaiah 55 and 11. What time are you on? Does he, do you normally get out? Two o'clock. Two. <laughs> <laughs> well, all you want. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 11. Uh, this is something that I do want to remind you of and say to you, uh, not in bragging, but I've done over 500 of these things in my lifetime, these services. Uh, I don't get a nickel for, none of the Gideons get paid for speaking. Uh, even the people who run the Gideon International for the whole world are out of Nashville, Tennessee. Not even the president of Gideon International draws a penny from any uh, offering that any church might give. So just keep that in mind. Those guys' salary is paid. Uh, our dues are $95 a year. There's 200,000 Gideons in the world. And uh, all, when all that money starts coming in, that pays for the all the officers to run an organization all over the world. Uh, he pay, pays for the secretary's jobs in Nashville. And um, so anything that you might give this morning will buy a Bible. So just keep that in mind. And, uh, so as we uh, begin this morning, uh, I want to mention one other thing to you. And that is here, I don't know, I'm from Obine County. Uh, this is a totally different camp. Any funds that you give today will come back here and be used in Dyer County. Uh, we send all the money in, all the camps send all the money in, and 40% of what's sent in comes back to buy Bibles that are put in schools and your hospital and, and things like this. So 40% of the money will be spent right here in this county. Uh, we just delivered this month two cases of Bibles to the hospital in uh, Union City, we're not allowed to go in the rooms anymore because of the HIPAA laws, and, uh, but the chaplains are allowed to take the testaments and put them in their snatch stands beside the beds. Uh, also, uh, we have a card program. Uh, we have cards thinking of you, in memory of you, in honor of you, and in recognition of you. If you'd like to send one, the Bibles are $5 a piece. You'd have to contact one of your uh, local Gideons and they can get the card sent to the proper person at the proper time, okay? I actually have in my hands, uh, my mother died in 2011 and my dad died in 2012. And here is a card that was actually, I went to the mailbox and many years as I've been in this and many years as I've asked people to use this card program, um, when it was sent to me, it touched my heart. Uh, just like this one. And this is my dad. It's in memory of Buddy Robertson. Ten Bibles were given by this individual. And um, as these were given, it began to come in. And then my dad got over 200 Bibles given in his memory. And my mother died uh, uh, the year before. Mother died in 11. Dad died in 12. And my mother had 160-something Bibles given in her memory. Now that I'm going to read to you what these Bibles are going to do for people, when I read this scripture verse, okay? But before, but first, oh, I want to mention one other thing. I, I told Miss Katie, said it right that time, called her Kitty a while ago. But uh, I, I speak a lot other than do the Gideon services and the churches I've been in the last four or five, y'all have more young people here in the, well, probably the last 20 or 30 churches that I've been in, unless they were really large churches. So it's not uncommon to go to church that has 15 to 25 people and the average age would be 70. 
I'm not running to save me now because I'm saving five. So uh, we all got to, if we live long enough, we're going to all go down that road. But I'm just saying, unless something happens, unless they have an issue to push to get all these young people and young couples out, those churches, most of these churches in 10 years are, will not exist. So you can put them on your prayer list, okay? But I compliment you on seeing young couples, young people. No offense to those of us who are graded, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, it just tickles me to death to see this. My first thing I ask for them, my wife always asks me when I go in, were there any young people there? So today I'm going to say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> there was. Uh, I'm from Real Foot Lake. I'm a member of the Obion County Gideon Camp. I live on Lake Drive, coming out of Soundberg, where everybody drives down through there and looks. If you happen to go right after Tornado, that trailer court that was obliterated, that was mine. <laughs> But it missed, it missed my house. Then it sat down and just wiped everything out. So we're thankful that uh, it skipped our home. A lot of homes didn't didn't get skipped, and we've had uh, one person killed that night, and we've had three more that have passed away from injuries since that time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this day and for all the blessings of life. I want to thank you, Lord, for what you do for us. I want to thank you, Lord, that you bless us beyond our own imagination. When we look at some of the other people around in the world and what they have and what they don't have, Lord. And Father, uh, we're so blessed. And Father, I want to thank you, Father, for all the people that are here today, Lord, regardless of what age they might be. We ask, so, Father, that you would bless this church, Lord, and it would be a shining example to the community, Father, that people would know that there's something going on in this building and they would want to come and be a part of it. Lord, we ask that you be with their pastor, Father, as he's at this convention and all the people who travel with him. Lord, we pray that you give them journey mercies and bring them back home to their families safe and sound. Now, Father, we commit this service into your hands. For Jesus, in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. I just want to remind you that of something as I stand here and talk to you that there that the Gideon Testaments are written in over 200 different languages and they're distributed to 199 foreign countries. Now there's about 225 countries on the face of earth give or take an uprising or, or a, an overtake of, of ISIS or somebody like that. And about the other 20, we're in every one of them except the Muslim countries that we're not allowed to. We're even in China and we're even in Russia. Uh, one of my friends from, um, his last name is Warren, Charles Warren from Tupelo, Mississippi. He was one of the uh, four or five guys that went over and talked to the Chinese government and got permission. We can't go into schools, we can't hand them out on sidewalks, but we can give them to businessmen who are in the churches, that they have several, several Protestant churches. We can give them cases of Bibles and they can go in and actually hand it to their people. Americans are not allowed to hand the Bible to a Chinese one-on-one, but the government gave this permission, and so in, in Russia there's also Protestant churches. Uh, so keep that in mind, keep these people in prayer. Uh, we have no idea in America how blessed we are to be able to hold a service like this, to be able to walk in when we want to, uh, to be able to, to say what's in God's Word and to teach what's in God's Word, and uh, we're very blessed. Also, uh, keep in mind uh, that there are over, uh, we give away almost 80 million Bibles a year. Now, this is not hardly this high yet right now, but it's climbing back. When we got to COVID, we dropped to 45 million a year. Now it's, it's coming back. It's getting back up in that range. Now, that seems like a lot because uh, that's a Bible every 2.37 seconds. So about every time your heart beats, there's a Bible leaving Nashville, Tennessee, going to somewhere in the United States or somewhere in the world. United States, there's only 18 countries out of these 199 that can or will or do have the funds to buy Bibles for their countries. So the United States uh, supports about 80% of the income to these third world countries uh, for, the, for, for Bibles to be printed, for Bibles to be distributed. And uh, they don't take it for granted in these other countries. And I'm gonna tell you about one here in a minute. But it's, uh, we have got actual films where in China some Bibles were open, I mean, the cases of Bibles were open 
and the people fell on their face and cried because they'd only heard of a Bible. They'd never even seen one. So we, if, we, if I were to back my pickup truck up the door and tell you all ought to go home and get all the Bibles you've had and bring them up here and put them in my truck, my pickup probably wouldn't hold them. But when you get in these third world countries, there may be one Bible in the whole town. So just keep this in mind. And here's another figure to look at. There's over 7 billion people on the face of the earth now. Over 7 billion people. In some of these foreign countries, we were told that there's people who are born, who live a normal lifespan. And know some of those foreign countries is 30 to 40 years, but who live a normal lifespan and never at any one time have enough money in their pocket to buy one copy of an American newspaper, let alone a Bible. We're very blessed that we could go down here to Walmart or most, a lot of stores, bookstores and all, and we wanted a Bible, we could pick one up, we could bring it home, and we could read it. But a lot of countries are not blessed like that. So that's why that we're out there uh, giving these Bibles out. So uh, I want to read to you from Isaiah 55, 11. It says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. That makes a promise that if we can get the word of God into somebody's hands, it's not going to fall on deaf ears. If they read that thing, God's going to start working on them. The Holy Spirit's going to start dealing with these people. And it's a promise that we have in the word of God. And that's why that I do what I do. That's why a lot of Gideons do what they do. We want to see the word of God out there and the word of God distributed. Now, we have all different colored Bibles uh, for certain things. This is actually a sidewalk or a school testament. This has a picture of a school locker on it. And this is, uh, we can no longer go into schools and hand them to the students, but we can take them, I don't know about Dr. County, but we can take them to the principal's office and the principal and the teachers can let the kids come by and pick one up if they fill out a form, to get permission from the parents to actually get one of these. But they're, they're all different color, colors. Now we have one that like this is about the color of those leaves. And it's, it's a Green Testament and we give these out at colleges. Now we have a story that comes back to us. We get a report every other month. And it's actually testimonies that are true testimonies of people who receive the word of God. And what this scripture verse says, it didn't return void. It became a reality in their life. Uh, you may say this is an accident. You may think this is a joke. I've had people come up to me after service, and I've told them they, that didn't really happen. This really happened. The Gideons were on a college campus, and uh, they were handing out copies of the Word of God, and, and they kept smelling something. They said, what is that smell? And somebody said, I don't know. It's coming from one of those buildings over yonder. And, uh, but the Gideons went ahead, and they were handing them out, and you would not believe on a college campus, the majority of kids will take one. A lot of them will take them and throw them in a paper can or a garbage can or throw them down on the ground after they walk away. Now then, the Gideons were handed out Bibles this day, and as they were handing them out, they handed one to this guy. He said, I don't believe in God, and I don't want that Bible. And one of the Gideons said, why don't you just take it home with you and just open it up and re read some of the self-helps in the back. And and see if it changes your view of the Bible. He said, I don't want it. I don't believe it. And I don't want it. And they took, kept on talking to him. So finally he stuck it in his pocket. He walked off. He got out of the couple of buildings over and got out of the side of the Gideons. And he just took that Bible and as hard as he could swing it, it went up in the air. He threw it up on the roof of a building. Sounded like he just disrespected the Word of God, didn't he? But guess who was on top of that roof? They were up there putting tar on the roof that day. There was a young Hispanic guy on the roof. It was lunchtime. Everybody else had gone, and he stayed up there for no room and reason. He was on the second floor. He was fixing to dive a head first off on the concrete, and he was standing there trying to get enough courage to leap over, and this Bible hit him in the head. True story. He came off the roof. He had tar all over him, and he got to asking, where did this Bible come? And so they said, well, those men down there under that tree, they're giving Bibles away down there. So he took the Bible down there and, went and got to talking to one of the Gideons. And he said, told him his story. And he said, I was up there. We were tarring the roof. 
And then Gideon said, now, now I don't know what the smell was. But they were tarring the roof. A guy's fixing to take his life. And a Bible hits him in the top of the head. He needs to open his eyes, doesn't he? And, but he did. And one of the Gideons led him to the Lord that day, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. What does his word say? That it will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish what he wants it to do. Back in Iraq, when we were over there fighting, and last time I was here, I told you about a friend of mine who got killed in Vietnam, uh, and uh, he had a Gideon Bible in his pocket. Well, when we were in Iraq and we were fighting over there a few months ago, a year ago, a few years ago, a helicopter virus was shot down. And all the insurgents came in and, and they were trying to kill all the Marines that was on that helicopter and all the Army boys. And the helicopter hit on its side and it didn't fall from very high up and some of the guys survived it. And the insurgents came in and they were shooting at them and, and trying to take their life. And finally the Americans came in and and uh, with their weapons and firing back, and they ran a lot of these people off, and they got to counting heads. There was a guy missing. And they couldn't find this soldier, and they, they were just hoping and praying that, that these, these insurgents had not captured him and had not taken him off somewhere. And there was a little clump of sand over there, and somebody saw a helmet sticking up, an American Army helmet. And they got to look at them, and they, they were pointing at him and they slowly eased around this thing. You know, we give one to every soldier that goes to the military that will accept a Bible. We all put one in their hands and this comes nearly every 80 something percent of the funds that we receive comes from church services just like this. It buys Bibles just like the one that was thrown to hit the ball in the head. It buys, it buys Bibles that those American soldiers were carrying. And they got around to the soldier and he had his head down. And they hollered at him and he didn't answer. And they hollered at him again and he didn't answer. And they eased around him. And they got up to him. And guess what he had in his hand? He had a camouflaged Bible just like this. All of them had the same words inside them. And his thumb was on the 23rd Psalm. You know what the last scripture was right above his thumb? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I tell people, wouldn't you like to know that you gave the money that bought that Bible that put it in that boy's hand that was looking for some peace and some, some to get rid of fear that was in his life? And he found it. Where? Isaiah 55, 11 says, God's word will not return in him void, but will accomplish what he wants it to do. That boy wasn't left alone that day. He had the word of God to comfort his life. And probably somebody in a church just like this somewhere in America probably gave the money that bought that Bible that put it in his hands. I told you that I've been doing this a long time. And uh, I go in churches and people come up. I have usually have all these different kinds of Bibles in my briefcase. And a lot of times I'll tell a story in the, in the church and and somebody come up and say, can I have a Bible like the one you talked about? And I'll give them away and I don't replace them, replenish them. I had a hospital testament that I didn't, don't have with me today. But uh, I was in a church in West Tennessee. And I'm not going to call the name of it. But I was in a church in West Tennessee. And I did a service and when it was over with, there was a little gray-headed lady sitting on the very back seat on this side here, in the very back corner. And... When I started out the door, I'd already taken up the offer and already given them a receipt. And I started out the door, and she'd done like this. And she said, come over. I want, you know, then I was young. She said, young man, come over. I want to give you something. And she held out her hand like this, and I opened, I put it, and I saw money go in my hand. And she said, well, a $20 bill, buy a hospital testament. I said, oh, yes, ma'am, it sure will. And I said, I've got a feeling there's more to this story than what you're saying. And she said, do you have a few minutes? And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. So I sat down on the seat beside her. And this is what she told me, a true story right here in West Tennessee. She said, I have a husband that was a good man. He provided for me and my daughter all of our life. We never had to want for anything. He took care of us. He provided a good home. He worked for us. He was good to us. He didn't run around on us. He read the Bible to us. I mean, we all sit down and read the Bible, and he would listen. 
But when it came time to go to church on Sunday, he wouldn't go. He said the only time he ever went to church was uh, on Christmas, Easter, funerals, and marriages. Other than that, he would not sit in foot inside a church. And he would tell her, said, I don't need church for me to go to heaven. And she said, yeah, but you're going to learn about what it takes for you to go to heaven if you go to church. But they would argue, and he would just go sit down in the living room. And so when they were, she said, when I was younger, me and my daughter would go to church. So this went on for years, and they would have revivals in this church. And, and people, with the pastor, they'd get the pastor and, and the evangelist to go visit this man. And when they would get up to his house, and he done got older that time, when he got up to the house, he would run and see, he would see them coming. He would go through the house, go out the back door and walk out into the woods. And his wife would beg him, Hun, please don't go. You need to hear what these men are going to say to you. And he says, I don't need it and I don't want it. And he'd walk off. Well, this went on for years. And one morning she told me, he said, I was fixing breakfast for him. And said, this is not coming from some foreign country. This happened right here in northwest Tennessee. Said, I was fixing breakfast for my husband. And I hollered for him, come on, breakfast is ready. And he didn't answer me. I hollered again, come on, breakfast is ready. And he still didn't answer. And she said, I went into the bathroom, in the bedroom and into the bathroom. And he was laying halfway in the bedroom floor and his legs were in the bathroom. And he had had a, a heart attack. And she said, I called my daughter and she called the ambulance. And they came and got him and carried him to the hospital. And said the doctor came in and talked to him after they examined him and said he's had a massive, massive heart attack. If, if he's alive for an hour, he said, there's no point in us sugarcoating this. If he's alive one hour from now, said, I'll be shocked. He said, he's not going to make it. And she said, my, I took my daughter by the hand and said, I went down to the chapel in this hospital. And this, this is this lady's own words. She said, Lord, you can take me, you can take my daughter. We're both ready to go, but don't take my husband. He's not ready. And Lord, I pray that you would just give him another chance in life, that you would, you would just let him find out who you really are and, and just please have mercy on us and don't take him. And she said he lived, through the, he lived through that afternoon and he lived through that night and the next day he was still alive and she said every day I'd go down to the chapel and she said I prayed the same prayer over and over and over. Said after a few weeks they said he was ready to go to uh, to a nursing home and he went to a nursing home and stayed a few months and went through recovery and he finally got back home again. And uh, so Sunday came and she said, Come on, get ready, we're going to church. And he said, No, I don't need I don't need church and I don't need the Lord. And so she said, I told him what I prayed, that God would give him another chance and God would have mercy on him. And he still wouldn't go and said, This went on for four, five, six, seven months, and said, one Sunday, one day he was not even sitting in a chair and just fell over again. And this time he had a massive stroke. And said the ambulance came and picked him up and they carried him to the same hospital. And we went through the same thing again. And they, the same doctor was on duty that night and said he made it the other time, but he will not make it this time. She said, guess where I went? I went back to the same chapel, got on my knees in the same spot, and I prayed the same prayer. And I started praying it over and over and over she said after a few weeks, he got sent to a nursing home because he was paralyzed on one side. He could no longer speak. And said, uh, I would go in and I'd see him every day. And when I went to leave, she said, I'd open the nightstand in the nursing home and there was a, a blue hospital testament. And she said, I would open it and read a few words and lay it on the nightstand beside his bed. And said he could move one side and the body and the other side he couldn't move. And said, I'd come back the next day he would rake that Bible off in the drawer and shut the drawer. He's talking about the Holy Spirit a while ago. He would deal with it. And she said, we played this game for months on end. I opened the Bible every day before I left. I'd read it to him, lay it on the night stand open, come back the next day, be closed back in the drawer and shut. And this went on for a long, long time. And said, one day our pastor came to visit him. And he walked up to the side of the bed and he said, he told him, he said, if you were to die right this very instant, where would you spend eternity? And he said, well, I'm a good man. I ain't got to worry about that. 
He said, the Bible don't say anything about you being a good man. It says that you have to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that relationship? And he said, of course, he, he was mumbling. He couldn't say the, all the words. But his wife could understand him, and she was interpreting some things for him. And finally, the preacher said, the man began to cry. It was the preacher was talking to him. And he said, would you let me read some scripture verses to you? And he said, he nodded his head. Well, the preacher took, reached in his pocket and took out a, a Bible out of his coat lapel and started to read it. And the man got real agitated. And the wife said, I thought she wanted me, him to read you the Bible. And he said, and he reached over and pointed at the nightstand. Same Bible, same words, but the Lord had been dealing with him through that scripture, or through that Bible. She said, he took that Bible out, the preacher, the preacher did, and began to read through it. He read Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, and John 3.16. And he said, can I help you pray? And the old man shook his head, yes. And he said, I, I laid him through a prayer and said, the old man was, was crying and tears were running down his face. And he said, I asked him, I said, where is Jesus now? And he took this good hand he could move. And he said, he's right here. He's right here. God's word didn't return into him void. She said, a few weeks later, I got a phone call during the night and my husband had passed away. She said, I went up there and me and my daughter, we were cleaning the room out, picking up things that needed to be taken to the house. And she said, I looked around in the room and we got everything and I looked over on the nightstand and there laid that Bible. And she said, Mr. David, I looked down the hallway. There wasn't any doctors or nurses coming. There wasn't anybody that knew me. And she said, I went over and I had a little big purse. And she said, I stole that Bible. She said, I raked it off into my big purse because that meant so much to me to know that that made a difference in eternity for my husband. And she said, I stole that Bible and that's the reason I'm giving you that $20. She said, will you go to room so-and-so and make sure that there's a Bible in that room? And I did, and it was already one there. God's word does not return in void. That's what I'm saying. If you give this morning, it's going to buy a Bible that could very easily end up in somebody's hands and needs it just like the ones I've told you about. I'm going to tell you one more, and I'm going to stop. Now, this one is very personal. This is about me and my family. In the year 2000, I had a granddaughter born. And you know how grandparents are about these grandkids. I already had two other ones. And I was excited about this third one, and it was a little girl. And she was born in a hospital in Fulton, Kentucky, and we went over and walked in, and she was laying under a light there. We couldn't get to them back then as easy as you can now. I mean, they kept them away from grandparents and all. And but the, she, I never could, get, I never did see her eyes move. So after a few days, we brought her home, and and uh, she was three, and she got up to be three months old. And and my uh, son-in-law wanted to take my daughter out on New Year's night to eat somewhere. So of course we. So they had a twist of arm, but we agreed to keep that baby. And I had her there, and every night, and I'd see her head jerk. When you jerk, her eyes would roll back in her head, and I told my wife, something's not right. I'm not a doctor, but something's not right with this child. So we confronted our daughter with it, and she said, Daddy, did you notice that too? And I said, yeah, me and your mother both did. Well, this started a journey. We took her to Union City Hospital, they sent us to Le Bonner. Le Bonner sent us to somewhere else. But times before she was three years old, she had seen 93 doctors. Sometimes we would go in hospitals, and I'm going to fall off this place. Uh, we would go in hospitals, and she, the, something was strange about her, and they'd go get other doctors. And, and so we'd go to a different hospital, and they said, well, what do you know about her? So my daughter... Tell us what's going on. My daughter got to put together like a Sears Roebuck catalog. Now, you younger people don't know what a Sears Roebuck catalog is, but it was thick. And she would just put page after page. So we'd go in the hospital, and the doctor says, what's going on? My daughter would just hand them this book. So they decided they wanted us to come back to Le Bonner in Memphis, and they wanted to see if light was going through her eyes to her brain stem. And the machine was broke down that day. Well, they said 
there's an opening in Kansas City, Missouri, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock at Children of Mercy Hospital. If you want to take her over there, we've already called. And they said, we think it's important to find out because they first thought she had a brain tumor. They, they did CAT scans. Her brain was fine. And uh, they looked at her spine for neurological problems. That was fine. Well, we didn't carry a suitcase with us. We didn't carry a toothbrush with us. We didn't carry another pair of socks with us. We were in a, a Ford Expedition, and me and my son-in-law and daughter and my wife and the baby, and we drove straight out of the hospital, went over across the bridge, took off to Kansas City. Next morning at 8 o'clock, we walked in that hospital over there, and they run, ran some tests on her, and the, the doctor who was running this test came out and said, this is an unusual child. Said, could y'all stay another day? And we said, well, yeah, we can stay another day. And uh, so we stayed. And the next day, she had us appointment with two more doctors. And those doctors looked at, him and said, looked at her and said, well, we want to send you to a specialist over here. And it was Kansas City in Kansas. So we went across the line into Kansas. And we didn't realize how hard it was to get appointment with this doctor. And we got in a room and people began to ask, how many months have you been waiting to get to see this doctor? And we didn't know we said anything wrong. We said, well, we found out yesterday was coming. And those people looked at us and said, well, we've been waiting four months. We've been waiting almost a year to see him. Anyway, he looked at her. So he called another meeting with some more doctors the next day. Long story short, on Friday, we were still in Kansas City. Uh, we had to go to Target, buy underwear and socks and deodorant and toothbrush and brushes and toothpaste and all this stuff. But anyway... On Friday, we met with all these, seven or eight of these doctors called us together. We went in this big room, and they looked at us and said, if she's got what we think she's got, she was three at that time, when she's got what we think she's got, she'll never see five years of age. You know, you hear about this in other families, but when it happens in your families, it's a different world. And you learn what, when somebody asks you to pray, they really want you to pray. And so my daughter looked up and said, you mean to tell me that, that my baby's dying? They said, ma'am, we can't prove it here, but we're going to send you to Atlanta, Georgia, the Scottish Rites Hospital down there. There's a specialist down there. We're going to send you down there. But if he diagnoses her what we think, she's going to have so many seizures and strokes. Or she'll start having strokes and then she'll pass away. That's not what we wanted to hear. So we took her back to our motel room, and my wife and I were in one room, and my son-in-law and daughter and the baby was in another room, and the baby couldn't get around very well. She was, she rolled, she, didn't, she never did walk. And Christy knocked on the door, opened the door. She handed her me. She said, Daddy, what are we gonna do? I'm not ready to lose my baby. So I took her in the room. I didn't have Bibles with me. I wasn't even in my car or, or pickup or nothing. But you know what I did? I went over to open the nightstand. And guess what was in there? A motel Bible. I don't know who bought that Bible. I don't know what Gideon carried that Bible and put it in that room, but somebody did. And guess what? God's word once again didn't return void. So when we took her to the baby, and I said, Christy, all we can do right now is pray. Because we, I'm, I'm an emotional person. I cry about everything. But I took that Bible, and I, it's got hit self-helps in the back of the Bible, and I began to read scripture verses to my wife and to my son-in-law and to my daughter. And we took Macy and laid her on the bed on top of this Bible. And we said, Lord, you created her, you made her, you know whatever cell in her body is. We're going to turn her over to you, Lord. We can't do anything else. We've gone as far as we go. We don't know where else to go. We don't know what else to do. We're going to put her in your hands, Lord. If you allow her to live, Lord, and have mercy on us, we'd appreciate it. But if you've got to take her home, we know that she'll be healed. Last October, Macy turned 22. And she had the disease that the doctor said 
that she'd never lived to be five. There's a film been done on her, and the doctors are still showing it. Uh, we had to sign permission for them to make this film. They don't use her name. They don't tell what state she's from. They don't tell her last name. They tell her first name. And we've, we, my daughter got hired, hired by this company. And it's a long story, and I don't, I'm not going into it this morning, but she was traveling all the United States and Canada working for this company. Um, we've got pictures of the Fonz waiting to get up to make a speech, and they're showing Macy's pictures, a movie to the, all the, it's like three or 400 doctors sitting there watching it. Uh, one of the ladies that's uh, a movie star, uh, can't even think of her name right now, but she's on TV a lot. She, she was sitting there waiting to make a speech. She has an autistic son, and they're showing Macy's film. I always say I've got the best known unknown little girl in the country because nobody knows who she is, but a lot of people have seen her. We carried her down to an eye doctor in Memphis, and they had seen the film and seen the surgery that took cataracts off her eyes at a year and a half of age. And the doctors came by and said, the, the, the doctor that did it said, this is the baby I've been telling you about. And they said, well, can we see it? And they got down there in the hallway on their knees and all got their lights out, got to look in their eyes. Just had to lay on the carpet, let out in the hall. So, but anyway, we still got her. She's not perfect. She's a long way from being what she needs to be. But she loves us. She knows all of us. And my wife sits on the couch. She's five, the, the, the baby is five, I say the baby, she's five, seven, weighs 120 pounds. And she'll take him over long legs and throw him across my wife's legs and lay her head on my wife's chest and rub her face. So, but this is the answer to people's problems. This is the answer to what's wrong in people's lives. God may not always answer our prayers the way that we think he needs to answer them, but he's not going to leave us hanging out there. He's going to go with us through whatever we go through. And because of Macy, I could go and tell you other stories of lots of people who have accepted Jesus Christ because they've heard her story and because it touched their life. And I thank you for letting me be with you today. I thank you for letting me speak in your church. And I just want you to say again that anything that you give today or anything you might give next week or whenever you want to give it will be used to purchase the Word of God and for no other reason. Nobody in our organization draws a nickel, okay? God bless you. Let's stand. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this day. I want to thank you for the people who have allowed me to be here today. Thank you for this church, Father, for opening its doors. And, Father, I pray that you might bless them in a special way in this community. For Jesus, in your name we pray, Lord.